Now more. Hello, it's Mr. Willis. We are on section 25.4, Meredith. Stop talking. We are on section 25.4, page 745. Drew, it's right there on the floor. There you go. There you go. Actually, you knocked it out. We're talking about segmented worms. 745. 25.4. Okay, so let's let's take a look at what we've done so far. According to this chart, we're just going in order on how these organisms evolved. Sponges came first, then cnidarians. Cnidarians had only two cell layers, then three cell layers evolved, and you have your flatworms, your acelomates, your roundworms and rotifers were your pseudocelomates. Everything else here are coelomates. And the mollusks we did yesterday, they're the first type of protostomes, coelomates. In the annelids and arthropods, segmentation evolved. So these are protostomes, meaning they form mouth first, but they have segmentation. Segmentation means your body is divided into segments. Like head bar. Um, even more than that, there are numerous in annelids, there are sometimes hundreds of segments that in, in each one is very similar which makes you able to have a big body but not a whole lot of extra information to build that body because each segment is just a copy of the one before it. So you don't have to have much extra DNA to get a much bigger body. Segmentation is very, uh, is, is very uh, worthwhile in that um, problem. So we're talking about, what are we talking about here? Earthworms, marine worms, which you're probably not very familiar with, and leeches. Earthworms, leeches, and marine worms. We'll talk about all these today. Like I say, they're true coelomates. They have a coelom, which is a body cavity. They are segmented. And here's one right here. This is what we're going to cut up tomorrow. Look inside of it, maybe check out. It's got a brain. Very small. A ventral nerve cord. That means a nerve cord running down the front of its body. We'll try and see that. This, this stuff is hard to see. Got five hearts. One, two, three, four, five. Kind of like me. Not really. You have one, that's fine. You have well, a lot has, of heart, though. That's bro, it has five pairs of hearts. Uh, that's correct. That's correct. So it has ten One legs. on either side. I guess if you want to consider the pair separate. Yeah. It's got uh, a digestive system that's complete. Dirt goes in through the mouth and comes out the butt. And all, while it's going through the organism, Anything that's in the dirt that could be useful as food is absorbed. And all the rest of it goes out. Question. Yes. What's that uh, like brain? This right here, the clitellum, is a mating organ. And what it does is its sperm squirts out of the clitellum onto the, onto the next worm. And these worms are hermaphrodites. So they both have ovaries and testes. So what they do is they get side by side and they trade sperm. I'll show you the mating in a minute. It's very exciting. <laughs> and uh, and so uh, that's for mating. They have two blood vessels that run the length of their entire body. They have a dorsal blood vessel on the top and a ventral blood vessel on the bottom. And you can see very clearly how they're segmented. Just one after another. Each segment just like the last. And I'll show you what those segments look like individually in just a minute. 
Some interesting parts, they have a, a pharynx, which is like a throat. The esophagus leads to the, uh, it doesn't really have a stomach, it's got a storage area called a crop. That's where the, the uh, dirt is stored temporarily. And then it's not showing the gizzard. Further down, it's got a gizzard. Oh, I love gizzards. Which, a gizzard has little stones in it and grinds up the dirt. It's almost like teeth. I love eating gizzard. In a chicken, you're eating a chicken gizzard, which no, is turkey, similar. No, turkey gizzard. So turkey, turkey, okay, turkey. Hey, bro. Yes? When I had a pet parrot, you had to, like, feed him food, and then you had to feed him, like, little grits, which are, like, little rocks, as far as eating. As far as it goes in the gizzard, yeah. yeah. And in the wild, they'll just eat little rocks. Rigidity in annelid segments creates a hydrostatic skeleton that muscles can push against. A hydrostatic skeleton is a water skeleton. What they do is they get water from, from the soil, they absorb water from the soil, and it get, goes inside them and is, is in there and it's very high pressure. Meaning it's the water is pushing out against the sides of their body. That's called a hydrostatic skeleton. So water pressure holds their body rigid. Hydrostatic. Hydro means water. Static means still. Hydrostatic skeleton. Segmentation permits segments to move independently of each other and enables a worm to survive damage. Segmentation is very useful. Segments can be specialized. For instance, this segment is specialized for reproduction. This segment is specialized to contain the brain. These segments are specialized to house the hearts and so forth. Here is if we cut a worm in half and look in on it, we see what it looks like. This is a single segment. Every segment has these parts. These orange things are the nephridia. Do you remember what nephridia are, are used for? Digestion. Nope. It's like like, like, waste. Releasing waste. And what happens is that there's little holes here that suck in the water. Remember I said this is full of water. Water is in here pushing outward against the walls to keep them outward. That's the hydrostatic skeleton. And the water is sucked in through this tube. And the tube winds around and um, much of the water is absorbed back. But the waste products, the bad stuff, is squirted out through little holes called excretory pores. It's the same thing your kidneys do. Your kidneys take water from your blood and filter out the bad stuff and you pee it out. And the good... Most of the water and all the sugars and salts and good stuff are, are retained in the blood. Well, that's what your kidneys do. So this is the first kidney. Kidneys started their evolution here in earthworms and in mollusks that we talked about before. Yes? What does Good question. The seti are little hairs, little bristles that stick out of the worm, and you'll be able to feel them tomorrow. When we do this dissection, take your fingers and run along the side of the worm, and you can feel those things. You can't really see them because they're almost microscopic, but you can feel them. They stick out of the body, and they anchor it in the dirt so that, so that they have some, they can kind of pull themselves through the dirt. With the, the little seti don't move, but the muscles of the worm move, and they need those seti to kind of anchor themselves into the dirt. Yes? So the water is not, is the water going through the orange tube? Or is it like just... Water? Yes. Yes, the water that's all in here, some of it gets pulled into the orange tube. And while it's moving through the orange tube, most of the water is absorbed back into the body. But the wastes that are in the water get excreted. So it pees out its side. Me it pees out these holes. It's like peeing out your belly button. So if you're ever holding a worm, realize there's microscopic amounts of pee coming out of it. And the worms we have tomorrow are dead, so they're not pee. Look at the blood vessels. There's the dorsal blood vessel that carries blood along the top. Bennett, up here. 
That's the ventral blood vessel that carries blood along the bottom. And what they're not showing is there's microscopic vessels going out in each segment to deliver oxygen and food to all the cells. They're not showing those. There's the ventral nerve cord. And that runs the length of the whole body and has little nerves going out from it. And they aren't showing all the little microscopic nerves that spread out in all directions. So that it can feel. So if you touch the worm, a signal goes to its brain and the worm goes, uh-oh, something's touching me. I better do something. And the brain will figure out what to do. And you can see it's got layers of muscles going all around the side. See circular muscles going all around the sides. And there's longitudinal muscles right there. So two layers of muscle running around it. Why do birds eat worms? Birds will eat anything they can eat, and if they see a worm sitting there, that's something they can eat, so it'll eat it. So, uh, worm is just kind of a soft, easy to eat creature, so it'll eat it. Easy target. Easy target, right. Yeah. Hey, you to so this shows the digestive tract. <coughs> This is talking about the digestive tract, and here you see it does show the gizzard here, and you should probably memorize this order. Mouth, pharynx, it's not showing the pharynx here, crop, gizzard, there's the gizzard, and then intestine. It goes all the way down to the air, here you see intestine. And then anus. That's the digestive system. So M -P -C -G Mouth, pharynx, crop, gizzard, intestine, anus. <coughs> Mouth, it doesn't show the pharynx on here. But there is a pharynx, this part's called the pharynx. Crop, gizzard, intestine, anus. Why is the mouth on the side? <laughs> it's kind of on the bottom. So mouth, mouth, pharynx, crop, intestine, anus. Mouth, pharynx, crop, gizzard, intestine, anus. Not ganglion, sit up. Gizzard. Not ganglion, it's crop. Video footage. An earthworm takes soil into its mouth. Listen. The beginning of the digestive tract. The crop is a sac that holds soil temporarily before it is passed into the gizzard. In the gizzard, a muscular sac and hard particles help grind soil and food before they pass into the intestine. The closed circuit circulatory system consists of enlarged blood vessels that are heavily muscled. An earthworm has a system of nerve fibers in each segment that are connected by ventral nerve cords to a simple brain located near the mouth. To move, an earthworm first contracts its longitudinal muscles on several segments, which bunch together, causing tiny cini to protrude and anchor the worm in the soil. Then the earthworm's circular muscles contract, the cini are withdrawn, and the worm moves forward. I just learned something. It's called it cini, not seti. I've always called it seti. <laughs> Could be that guy's accent. Yeah, maybe maybe he's saying it wrong. Yeah. Now, if the blood stays in vessels the whole time, like it does in the earthworm, that's a closed circulatory system. Most annelids have closed circulatory systems. Most mollusks that we learned about yesterday They're have open. an open circulatory open. system, meaning that the blood doesn't stay in vessels. The blood is just floating freely throughout their body. It's not contained in vessels. And in an open circulatory system, the heart just acts like a pump and just pushes it into an open space. And the blood then goes everywhere in the body and circulates and eventually makes it back to the pump, and the pump pumps it again. So it's just kind of an open circulation. The blood goes anywhere. In us, the blood stays in tubes. So it's a closed circulation. It's always in tubes. And the tubes get real small and go to every cell. So every cell is near a blood vessel. So that's a closed circulatory system. That's what they have. What about a respiratory system? Well, they don't really need one. They take in oxygen through their skin. 
as long as the skin is kept moist, they can absorb the oxygen through the skin. The problem is, if the skin is not moist, the cells dry up and oxygen and become hard, and oxygen won't go through. So if you put a worm in front of a fan, it would die. It would die. And it would suffocate. Isn't that weird? You put it in front of a fan and it can't get any air. And this is also why you only see worms when it's after it rains. Because otherwise they have to stay in the ground where it's wet. But when it rains, it gets, it's all wet on the ground, they can come up on the surface and still keep their skin moist. Have you ever seen Godzilla? Yeah. The very beginning where he puts the, the like, two electrical things up. Yeah. And he, he makes it come up. up. Yeah. Yeah, that also had the biggest worms in the world, the giant earthworms, which I'm about to show you yeah. a picture of. Yeah. Now, the uh, aquatic annelids, the, the, the worms that swim in the ocean, which I'll show you in just a second, they don't have to worry about drying out. So they have what are called gills, little extensions on the surface of their body that help absorb oxygen which I'll show you in just a minute, too. I already talked about the nephridia in each segment. The, they show them here, the little yellow things. Every segment has two of them, and that's used for getting rid of waste. Mm -hmm. They're the nephridia that we're interested in. I already talked about those. Sexual reproduction of earthworms. Um, Let's take a look. Here's a couple of earthworms mating. And you see the clitellum here, and you see that white stuff there? That's worm sperm. Hey, that rhymes. I'm a poet, and I don't realize it. What? You weren't going to say no. Worm sperm is passed from the one, one uh, worm to another through the clitellum. And you can see the sperm there, and there's sperm over here, too, because both worms uh, pass sperm to the other. They because they're hermaphrodites, they have both sexes. They don't pass eggs. They just pass, they just pass sperm. They have the eggs contained in their body. So once they see another worm, they can mate with it. Here's the advantage of being her hermaphroditic. You don't have to find a male or a female. Any worm you see, you can mate with. So if they see another worm, they mate with it. They, they gather sperm from the other worm. And then they fertilize all their eggs. Then they lay their eggs in the dirt. And the little eggs will hatch and grow into baby earthworms in the dirt. Thank you. Nice. A lot of worms put their eggs in a little cocoon in the dirt. So it's not like here's an egg, here's an egg, here's an egg. All the eggs are together in the little cocoon. And the cocoon will hatch hundreds of worms. Isn't that gross? That is my baby. Which one? <laughs> Biggest earthworm in the world. The giant earthworms are only found in Australia. How big? Everything else sucks in Australia. Oh, jeez. Oh, that's a snake. That's a worm, actually. Again, again, again. 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 Video footage! This is about all worms. This next group of animals is going to require some caching. So we're going fishing for worms. Not with worms, but for worms. I put some meat into this little cage. Many worms love meat. The cage is to prevent uh, fish from stealing our meat. So I'm going to throw this into the water and come back in a little while to check on it after the worms have had a chance to find it. Well, we're back here to check on our bait, so why don't I reel it in and take a look and see what we've caught. Looks like we 
we've got some. The limbs are pretty small, so I'm going to take this bait and we'll take it back to the lab to take a look at some of the worms. <laughs> Well, our fishing expedition was a great success, and we landed a fine catch of worms. Now I'm going to take this flex cam, which is a kind of a video camera, and attach it to the microscope so we can take a closer look at our worms. And here's what they look like close up. Worms get their names from their shape. These are flatworms, and they belong to the phylum Platyhelminthes. That, as you may have guessed, means flat worm. There are three main worm groups. We've already seen the flat worms. Now we're going to take a look at the round worms and the segmented worms. And here are some tiny round worms, or nematodes. Looking like tiny strands of spaghetti with pointed ends, round worms make up the second major worm group. And finally, here are some fine looking examples of our third major worm group that I just dug up. Notice how their bodies are divided into numerous rings, or segments. That's why they're called the segmented worms, or annelids. They're the last major worm group. Now I know worms aren't much to look at, but as we'll soon see, worms of one kind or another have achieved some of the animal kingdom's most impressive firsts. Take sex, for example. The whole notion of separate males and females, of having different sexes, that we humans take for granted first appears among the round worms. But that's not all. Every time we take a bite, we owe a debt to worms. That's because the round worms also develop nature's first efficient digestive system. To see how that's so, this is pretty lame. Will we run here on yeah. I love this. Oh, oh, there's a worm dissection. Oh, That's what we're going to do tomorrow. Did he already kill it? <laughs> no. Oh, and there's a tape worm. That's the gross thing I've heard. What is it? You need to cook, you need to cook your food so you don't get tape worms. He already said we didn't have to. No, we didn't. Okay. Here are the different phylums. I'm not going to write them on the board because I have them up here. Or the different classes. We're in. We're in phylum Annelida. Annelida means segmented worms. And there are three classes you have to know. Good multiple choice stuff. Class Oligochaeta are the earthworms. Class Polychaeta are the marine worms. And class Hirudinia are the leeches. This is written in your book. Oligochaeta earthworms. Polychaeta marine worms, that marine means salt water, or, or water worms. And Hirudinia are the leeches. And the last one would be like Mr. Wilson. So let's take a look. Of course, these are that's an earthworm. That's oligochaeta. Here is a polychaete. Polychaete worms are segmented worms that you find swimming around in the water. And they come in a bunch of different kinds. You can see they have little bristles on their side, the little paddles. And here it shows them up close. The paddles are called parapodia. And what they do, each of those move like this. And imagine their whole body is filled with them. So they got four or five hundred paddles moving back and forth, paddling them through the water. It's like, like a big cruise boat, kind of, only underwater. And at the front they have these jaws. The jaws can eat things, can bite things. Some of these things can actually be poisonous. And a lot of them, though, are filter feeders. Instead of, uh, instead of biting and catching prey, these projections they have coming off their head have evolved into structures that look like fans. You see these fans right here? That, that, that's part of, that's a worm head. They call these things Christmas tree worms. And these things are, are real sticky and covered with mucus. And anything floating around in the water will become trapped by these 
parts right here. And I don't know if you noticed, when I passed around this clamshell, and I'll do it again, it's covered in little white things. That's what I was The white things are, are worm uh, homes. The worms will build a, a tough shell and live inside that. And you can see if you look down, there's a little opening that the worm lives in. And so this, they have this tough shell that they build. Um, it was made of calcium carbonate. It's very hard. And they stick their heads out that look like this. And they filter the water. They filter feed. Yeah, let me pass them around. You can see this one's real good. You can see the opening here. I'll start one on this side and one on this side. And so these are called polychaete worms. And I got two videos of them. They live in different ways. This one's called a sea mouse. It's a worm. Because of its size and thick covering of fine hair-like structures, this worm is known as the sea mouse. Only from below are the characteristics of the bristle worm visible. Those are the parapodia that it swims with. So as not to be left exposed by the ebbing tide, the sea mouse buries itself. If you ever go to the beach and look on low tide, you'll see a bunch of holes yeah. in, the, in the ground. Yeah. Most of those are worm holes. And there's little worm. If you dug it, dug it up, there'd be a little worm under there. That looks huge, though. That looks huge. It's not that big. The sand mason worm starts life as a planktonic larva inside a tube of jelly. It feeds by trapping tiny particles of organic matter on its sticky tentacles. When it grows up, it will burrow in the sand of some distant beach. The adult sandworm has a crown of tentacles which it can extend from the shore card sand. The worm lives in a vertical burrow, but that's not the extent of its building skills. First, it has to spit out the sand which was washed into its burrow at low tide, and then it starts picking up more sand a grain at a time. Look at this worm. It's the weirdest looking worm. That's one worm. Those are all tentacles. It's a slow process, but watch what happens when it's speeded up. This is underwater now, a worm building a little fortress. One sand grain at a time. Once the calm is complete, the sand mason worm begins to build its branching superstructure by sticking individual sand grains together. Bear in mind that this is underwater. And then try to imagine what kind of glue it must be using. The end result is a top branching tree of sand which traps particles drifting in the water to feed the worm. Sand mason worm. And there's some leeches. These are called medicinal leeches. And a lot of countries, they use this to remove blood from under the skin when there's a bad bruise. And so they put the leeches on, and the leeches have two suckers. An anterior sucker in the front and a posterior sucker in the back. And they suck blood. And this is how they feed. If you ever go swimming in a swamp or something like that, you can get leeches on you. And the leeches, when they get on you, they're usually real small. But after they suck your blood, and you can't feel them because they inject an anesthetic that, that makes it numb, so you can't feel them. And so they'll suck blood, and this person's had a surgery. Listen, this person's had a surgery. Please stop talking. A surgery where there was a bunch of blood under the skin, and they just put a couple leeches on there, and they suck all the blood out, and the person can't feel it, and it's a good way to get rid of blood under the skin without having to cut somebody open and stick a tube in there. Um, so a lot of countries use this. In America, we don't usually use leeches because we think it's gross, but a lot of countries have no problem with them, and, uh, and people use those regularly. Uh, I don't know if you saw, there was a, a dirty job, so they were like, Minnesota, and we were like, Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.